On behalf of the Northeast Church family, I want to thank you for joining us today. There are a lot of other things you could have been doing today besides meeting us here for worship and teaching, but you have chosen to invest your time in seeking spiritual things and finding out more about the Lord. We live in a world full of distractions and we live in a world full of choices and you've made the choice to be with Jesus along with us. Uh, it's my hope that the time that you are investing with us today in this choice in this moment will help you to face the challenges of this week and to live in genuine hope every day beyond that. Let's get started. Good morning. Let me think. Ah, there it comes. Thank you. I tell you what, I am so happy and so proud of our AV crew. And I will say this every now and then when you're dealing with audio visual, those of you who've worked with it, do you ever have a gl glitch with AV? And I'll tell those maybe who you're new joining us this morning, you've never joined with us before and we had that little slight glitch. I will tell you right now up front, 99% of the time, if there's a glitch, I'm to blame. All right, I just want you to know that because a lot of times I'm not doing what I need to do and these guys, a lot of them volunteering many, many, many hours do what they do uh, to help make this church uh, the kind of church it is. And I just wanna tell you right now, I'm happy to be a part of this church I'm blessed to serve as one of the ministers at this congregation. I love this church. I love seeing more of you as the weeks go on. And while we don't for sure know what everything's going to be looking like over the next couple of months, our leadership is working on it, and we will keep you informed as we move forward. I'm just glad that we can meet this way, and I'm glad that people are able to meet online because God can be more than one place at one time, correct? And that's a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about this morning, not completely, but part of it. But before I do that, I want to welcome uh, Timothy and Christina uh, Picotti. Uh, they are sitting right over there, and their children. They came a couple of weeks ago, received a letter from a member at the Alta uh, Mesa Church of Christ near Fort Worth, Texas, to talk about them and to recommend them and they want to become an active part of what's going on here at Northeast and as we have been talking about following in the steps of Jesus in the way their story is an interesting story as they have followed in the steps of Jesus originally from Bhutan which is north of India they were basically political and religious exiles who were basically removed from the country, had nowhere to go, they and thousands of others, and ended up in Nepal at, at a camp that was set up by the United Nations. And it was there in Nepal that they were led to faith in Jesus, uh, followed him, and there were a lot of costs, a lot of difficulties in their life to get them up to the point where they are now. So when we talk about following Jesus, and we talk about the first week, talking about the cost of following Jesus, they, they lived it out in, in terms of converting to Jesus in an area where uh, almost 100% of the people surrounding them do not have faith in Jesus. And there were a lot of difficulties associated with that. But I bet Timothy and Christina would say this morning that it's been worth it. Would you say amen to that? Amen. It's been worth it. And so as we introduce this whole concept of discipleship and what that means and what it means to follow in the steps of Jesus as we follow his direction 
as we seek to live as he lived and be moved by him. While there are costs, Jesus told us to take up our cross daily and follow him. If we're not willing to give up everything, then we're not worthy to be his disciples. So the call is a very, it's a challenging call. It really is. It's a challenging call. But it's a call that brings far more, far more, much more in the terms of abundance and blessing than we would ever give up. Jesus says, give up everything. And in saying that, he says, I want want you. I'm, I'm calling you to be completely mine. And depending on where we are, if it's Bhutan or Nepal or other places in the world, sometimes that carries with it a great, great cost. Now, Jesus, as he is talking to his disciples. In the discourse that we began looking at last week in John chapter 15, Jesus made the point that if you're going to be my disciples, I want you to understand that I am calling you to bear fruit. In fact, Jesus says, by this you will show or demonstrate that you're my disciples by the fruit that you bear. And I challenge you, I call you to bear much fruit. And so we talked about what that means last week, about the idea of it being personal, that Jesus encourages us to abide in him. And I mentioned that that's not just some concept, it's really and truly being connected to Jesus. And that following Jesus and producing fruit in our lives is is not passive. We're engaged in that process. And I'll have a little bit more to say about that this morning as I talk about the Holy Spirit. And the third thing is something that we all need to remember when walking in the way and being his disciple and wanting to show ourselves disciples by producing fruit so that people can look at us and say, there's something different about them. There's a a quality in our lives that is tasty and draws other people to Jesus. We also need to understand, and this is review, We also need to understand that it's a process. And what I mean by that is there's not a single one of us here this morning who could say, I've arrived. I am everything that God wants me to be or God will ever want me to be. I'm not there and you're not there either. So discipleship and following Jesus in the way is more of a process of growth and is measured in progress and not by perfection. Perfection is what we seek in the perfect being and life of Christ. And as we do that, we're going to grow. In, and, but I'm not going to be right where you are, or you're not necessarily going to be right where I am in the discipleship process. And so my encouragement to you was don't get too preoccupied with comparing yourselves to others. Let's just all compare ourselves to Jesus and we'll pay attention to others as they follow Jesus, we'll follow them. But we're all in different places. And so in this discussion of producing fruit, what Jesus says in John 15, it doesn't arise out of a vacuum. It's a part of a discussion. It's a part of a discussion, a discourse that Jesus begins and we start reading about it in John 13. In fact... In the book of John, imagine this, in the book of John, John 13 through 17, that contains a third of the words that are recorded in the the book of John, and it represents just a few hours in the life of Jesus. Let me ask you this question. Do you think it's important? So John is writing this auto, this biography of Jesus, and he's writing it about 90 AD. And he is an old man. I don't know exactly how old he was, but you just do the math in terms of it being 90 AD, Jesus 30, 33 AD. He's an old man, and especially in those day standards. He doesn't have long to live on this earth. And as far as we know, historically, he may very well have been the last apostle to die, the last one living. 
And so he's one of those who has that last connection to Jesus in that special way as an apostle. And Christians are beginning to face persecution in the 90s. The rule of Domitian was uh, terrifying in many places in the Roman Empire, certain locations of the Roman Empire. And so during that time, John also wrote when, when he was in isolation on the Isle of Patmos, the book the, the received this revelation from God through Jesus to encourage those people who are suffering and struggling in the face and facing trials as disciples of Christ. And some of them had concerns about going on. You hear the apostles are dying and people who had a personal connection with Jesus, they're dying off. And now John's not going to be around with us long. It was important. He knew it was important as God was working in his life to give another account of the life of Jesus, to tell the story again because of what they were facing. And John includes a lot of material in his gospel that's not included in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there's a reason for that. There were some key things that John wanted them to understand and wants us to understand because some of those things that those Christians were struggling with in the 90s AD were some of the same things that the apostles struggled with. Because they're now with Jesus, they have cast in their lots to follow Jesus and follow him wherever he would take them and they believe he's the Messiah, but they're finding out very quickly that things are not panning out the way they perceived they would or hoped they would. Jesus is talking about dying and Jesus is talking about leaving. And their hearts are troubled. Their hearts are troubled. And so as John writes these words about 90 AD, he's writing it for Christians who will be reading these words that apply to the situation that he and the other apostles and the early disciples faced, but it's some of the same things that you and I wonder about and some of the same things that we face. I mean, he made it clear to them in the 15th chapter, there's still something for you to do. I want you to bear fruit, and I want you to bear fruit by abiding in me and the things we talked about last week, being engaged in that process. But what is interesting to me is sandwiched on either side of this discussion in John 15 about being a part of the vine, being connected to Jesus, and growing and producing fruit. What precedes it is important, and what follows it is important. And obviously, we don't have time to look at all of that this morning. But one of the primary themes before and after his discussion in John 15 about producing fruit as a disciple is what he says about the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus is saying, I'm going away. And when I go away, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to receive you to myself. And we're going to be together forever in my father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, I would have told you. And I'm preparing that place for you. And someday we'll be together forever in that place, in my father's house, forever. But what he's talking about is going away. And then he's going to be raised from the dead. And then he's going to ascend. He's going to be gone. And he wanted to assure them. And so in this next slide, you can see from the reading this morning, the bottom line that Jesus wanted them to understand as disciples and the bottom line, at least in this section, is you're not alone. You're not without my presence. I won't be with you, but I will be with you. Jesus, before he left in Matthew 28, we'll talk about this verse in a couple of weeks. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, in a very real, real way. And yet, he's in heaven at the right hand of the Father. So how can he be with us and them? And he says to them, I want to tell you, I'm going to give you another advocate, another comforter, another counselor. 
and he's going to be with you, the spirit of truth, he will be with you forever. Forever. And he says, he lives with you because he's present and powerfully exhibiting who he is in the life of Jesus who has the spirit without measure. They're not unfamiliar with the work of the spirit. You remember when Jesus was baptized and the Holy Spirit came upon him in that visible form that was shown a dove, but that represented not the reality, but it was a symbol of the reality. And that was this union between Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, so you've seen him, but he lives with you and he will be in you. You're not going to be alone. I want you to know right now, whatever it is you're facing, whatever that struggle is and whatever that anxiety may be, and you may feel isolated physically, you may feel isolated emotionally. And there may be times where you feel very lonely. But in Jesus, connected to Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, you are never alone. Ever. You're not alone, even if you're isolated. And Jesus, in talking to them, he's saying, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. To be an orphan back in this day, to be without a mother and a father, so difficult to live in this way. And it was the early Christians who took responsibility many times for these abandoned children who were, who were left with no one. Jesus said, I'm not, listen, I'm leaving you, but I'm not leaving you alone. I'm coming back. And he's not just talking about the second coming, and he's not just talking about them seeing him after the resurrection. I'm going to come back and be with you in a, in a very real present way. I'll come to you. But it's clear from the context, he's talking about being with them in the person or the reality of the Holy Spirit. Do we all have that so far? You understand that point? Jesus, is it Jesus? Is it the Holy Spirit? It, well, yes, and, and yes. And no, go back, go back. Because this verse is very important. And this is one that was not read. I'm, I'm, I'm starting to read in verse 20. It says, on that day you'll realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he's the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Now, I want to pause right here real quick. This is a, this is a pause. It's not a bad tangent. It's just a pause. And I want to tell you a little bit about next week. Because what Jesus is saying here about obeying his commands and what he is saying about love, and he talks about love over and over again, I will dig into that in a lot more de detail next week in terms of our relationship with each other. Because Jesus felt that was important enough to stress, not, my, not stressing that today, but I will next week. That's just a, a preview about how do we live for and with each other as his disciples. As we're, as we're following all along the road. I will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Because Jesus has already said, Listen, the world doesn't understand this stuff. The world doesn't understand me. The world doesn't understand all this talk about the Holy Spirit. They can't accept it. They don't understand it. But he says, You do. And Judas says, Lord, you, why do you just intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Is this just for us, just the ones we're ga gathered around you right now? And Jesus answers him immediately. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me. You get it? If anyone loves me. No, Judas, this isn't just for you. Anyone who loves me and will obey my teaching, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make 
our home with him. Isn't that powerful? And that, once again, that brings to mind the language I talked about last week when Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone's willing to open the door and let me in, I'll come in, I'll sit down, we'll dine together. It's, it's, a, it's a living, connected relationship, and this connection is brought about through the work and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so in that reality, the, the, the Spirit with disciples is Jesus present with disciples. It's the Father present with disciples, but it's through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, no, 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 not just you. I'm not trying to hide, hide myself or who I am or what my plans are from everyone. If, if anyone loves me, if anyone follows me, the Father and I will come in and we'll, we'll make our home in him. We'll live in him through the Holy Spirit. And so this word, parakletos, is the Greek word, and it is translated in all kinds of different ways. So depending on your translation, it may say comforter, it may say counselor, it may say advocate, it may say helper. And those are all good translations. This is a rich, powerful word. And it's a word that was used to describe Jesus himself. Did you know Jesus is called our paraclete in the New Testament? In several places. So the one who was the paraclete was the one who sometimes might have been called to the side of somebody who is in a court case and speak on their behalf and defend them and be their advocate, stand beside them. But a paraclete was somebody also who might be someone who offers assistance or help to someone else. And if I'm carrying a heavy load and I need help and I can't do it by myself, you being my advocate, you being my helper, you come to my side and you help me lift that load. You help me bear that burden. So in that sense, a helper, a comforter, so many different ways to describe that. The isolation and the separation that so many have felt in so many ways over the past uh, year has, has been difficult. It's been a challenge, hasn't it? But Jesus is saying to us, and he said to them, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you. And that's been true when we have been our most isolated, and it's still true today. And that is certainly Nice to know. Amen to that. So just how crucial, just how crucial is it that you embrace this truth? And now you may think that's kind of a silly question. Of course, I, I embrace this truth. But I can remember a day when I was attending college and going to school preparing to be a minister, I can remember discussions within a school context or a lectureship context that people were debating how the Holy Spirit dwelled in the life of a person. And there were some who would say something like this. They'd say, well, I, I don't believe, I believe the Holy Spirit helps a person, but I don't believe in the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. And some of you are saying, What? And some of you are familiar with this, but it, it was the belief that the Holy Spirit will not work directly in your heart or your mind in any way. And that the only way the Holy Spirit will work or function in your life, and the only way the Holy Spirit dwells in you as a Christian, is if you read the words that the Spirit inspired and you take them and you apply them to your life. And maybe if you memorize a passage and you you take it to heart, it's only in that sense that the Holy Spirit will dwell in your life. It's not a real presence. It's not a living presence. It's not a dynamic presence. It's just you, like if you liked, uh, you loved Abraham Lincoln and you wanted to devour anything that's been written about Abraham Lincoln and you've read all the books about Abraham Lincoln, you might consider yourself a devotee or a disciple uh, of Abraham Lincoln. 
You know it all. You, 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 all his quotes, all his speeches, and they've, they've affected your life. So in that sense, you, you know, he, he dwells in you. They would say that's really the only sense that the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Which I say, without getting off on too much of a tangent here, I believe that's heresy. I do. To, de to deny a plain, clear teaching, and I'm not just talking here, I'm talking Romans chapter 8, I'm talking about what Paul says in Ephesians, what John says in 1 John, to deny the real living presence of the Lord in our lives in a way beyond, I just uh, want to apply the, his words to my life, is, is missing the point altogether. Your body is the dwelling place, the temple of the Holy Spirit. I heard a preacher one time say, well, if that's true, that makes you divine. That was his argument against the real presence of, well, God can do it in a way that won't make me divine. He can handle that. I'm just called to accept his word because it makes a difference in how I live and what I do. I can't fully explain, explain it. Metaphysically, I'm not even going to begin to try to explain that any more than I can explain when I pray that God intervenes in some way as I pray to do things in my life and the lives of others. Jesus has already been talking about this praying and asking and it being done as we're shaped by his word and his will He'll, he'll respond to those prayers. What about him working in your life? What about, what about, I know some of you can talk about moments in your life where you know for a fact as you've been praying and seeking and searching, God's intervened. God's done something in your life, in your heart, in the heart of somebody else, in circumstances to bring about a good, positive, hopeful result. You ever, you ever say something like, you know, it's a God thing. You ever say that? You just know. You just know. It's a God thing. And to believe that God's Holy Spirit does not work within us and affect us without violating His will or, or doing something in us that violates His word. Why is it so important? I'll... I'll, I'll Say this, number, number one, it's important because we're going to be more fruitful as disciples if we believe this. Now, I believe when we embrace any truth and act on any truth, that we're going to be blessed and we're going to bless others. And as we do that as disciples, in our relationship with each other, that's next week, that things will happen and things will be different. But if I believe, truly believe, what Jesus says here about we're going to make our home in you, we're going to live in you, we're going to be present with you, we're going to dwell in you, that that is a powerful motivation to act and do and grow. To believe that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Paul felt that was important enough when he was encouraging Christians to resist sin and sexual immorality. That's when he was talking about your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You want to take that body of yours and join it with a prostitute? You've been bought with God. And so if we look at John 14, and what he says, all this I've spoken while I've been with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. So in the Bible classes this morning, John was talking about making time for worship and prayer and quiet time. It's in those contexts, I believe, and other contexts as well, that the Holy Spirit can do what's being talked about here in our lives. Now, the application to the apostles is different from us in this sense. They were with him. They heard his teaching. They heard his words. And he's saying to them, 
I'm, you're not going to forget those. What I want you to remember, you're going to remember. And they wrote those things down. And that one of the, those results is the New Testament. And so I can't always apply every promise in every single way like an apostle can. I don't believe the Bible's still being written today. But I do believe that the Spirit in me will help me as I focus upon those things that will help me grow. And I'm in situations, the Spirit may help me remember something in a situation that will help me in my life as a disciple. Maybe not exactly the same application, but as the Word abides in us, uh, they're going to make a difference in our lives. I'm going to give you a, an assignment. Okay. How, how many is up for an assignment? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to do this this week. This is, this is like the practical application point of this lesson. It's also in your bulletin on page four. I'm going to ask you to memorize five or six verses this week. Man, I know that scares some of you. Some of you could do it in five minutes. When you get old like me and my brain doesn't work as well as it used to, it takes me a lot longer to do stuff like that than it used to. But Ephesians chapter 3, it was in the elders letter this week. If you clicked on the bonus, it was there. I'm going to ask you to memorize Ephesians 3, 16 through 21. Because it is a prayer, it is a prayer, it is something that we do, but it is a prayer about God's work in our lives. And this will be a practical thing we can do to help us grow in this discipline in the Holy Spirit. I pray that out of God's bountiful riches, that he will strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may be able together with all the saints have the power to grasp the height, the depth, the length, the breadth of the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses understanding, comprehension, so that you might be filled up to the measure of the very fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably, abundantly more than anything we can ask or imagine, according to the power that's at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ for all generations. Amen. Take that prayer to heart. Learn it this week. And as you pray this prayer, next week, hopefully by heart, pray it as your own. Even as you're learning it, learn it as your own. And pray that prayer for you and pray that prayer for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And God will honor that prayer. Look what that prayer says. Paul believed that prayer would make a difference. It's a practical step, but it could be a powerful step. I'm going to skip my next point. I'll have more to say about it next week, but just, it's a great, it's a great point, but let's go to the next slide. No, no. Oh, you already skipped it. Ah, that's it. I'm not going to talk about this today, okay? But this is a fact. When we grow from the inside out, the Spirit of God working through us, the saying that Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3 about the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. 
So important. We will do more and we will be more motivated out of love that we pray about and lives within us and therefore we'll do more things that God calls us to do and it'll be coming from the inside out. It won't be some, just some ritual or some rule. All right, you can move on. So I want to close with this thought and a couple others. I, I know how we are. I know how I am. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to be in the presence of Jesus? Do you ever think, do you ever think that way? I just, I, I just, if he could just be here, just present, or if I could have lived back in the day of Christ when he walked the earth, and if I could have been there with him, man, you know, that would make such a difference. And, may, and maybe in some ways it would. But I'm here to tell you, he is here. He is here. He's here. The presence of his spirit with us is real. If you're a disciple of Jesus, the spirit of the living God lives in you to be your helper, to be your advocate. And if you have the Spirit, you have the Father. If you have the Father, you have Jesus. Yeah, I know. Some of it is, is, is mis mystical. Yeah, there's mystical things about our faith in the sense that you can't fully 100% explain them metaphysically. But if we believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and he lives, it's possible. And so when Jesus closes out this section that I'm looking at and he says to the disciples peace I leave with you my peace I give you I don't give you as the world gives don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid he shared that with a group of men who were troubled and afraid and had doubts and had in inadequacies and insecurities and so he's just talked about the spirit who will help them with with all of these things they needed it to be the men they were and I need it, and you need it, to be the disciples Jesus has called us to be. I don't know where you are in your journey. I know where some of you may be on your journey. And we, we want to be here for you. We want to help you. We want to encourage you. The Picatis, you know, have jumped on board this week, and they're ready to become more active in what's going on here at Northeast. Their story is, is, is exciting. There may be other families who are thinking about becoming an active part of our family here at Northeast. We want to encourage you to let us know if you have that interest. And certainly, if you believe Jesus is the Son of God, and you believe that God raised him from the dead, and you are ready to commit your life to him and give him everything, you are certainly ready to be baptized and repent, right? And don't forget, Acts 2.38, it's not just the promise of forgiveness of sins. Peter said there on that day, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God bless you as you continue to seek his will for your life. And let us know after the service today, anytime, how we can help you. You may want to be baptized today. We'll take care of that. Just let us know. And thank you for your good attention. Far from the presence of his family and his father making some really bad choices in his life. So to make a short story even shorter, his life falls apart and he comes to the end of his rope. Thankfully, at the end of that rope, there was still a father who loved him and never quit seeking him. This story reminds us that no matter how broken or needy or desperate we may be, 
we will always have a loving Father who can take our broken pieces and repair them through the work of Jesus. We'd love to encourage you in whatever way we can to search for the answers that are found in Jesus. And if you want to, check us out at northeastchurch.com. And God be with you till we meet again.